All right, uh, thanks everyone, and welcome to the second day of uh, our Exostar reunion conference. It really was a very interesting first day, I think. I'm really looking forward to the talk today. Welcome to session three, which is about the characterization of exoplanets, which was another important piece of the workshop last year. Um, we will have three talks to start out with, then we'll have a half hour discussion period, and then we'll have four lightning talks. If you're giving a lightning talk, I will display your slide and you can, you will be unmuted and can speak about your slide. So when we have the first three talks, um, there's 15 minutes allocated for each. If there's time afterwards, we'll take questions right then. But remember that there's going to be a half hour discussion period. So if we don't get to your question right after the talk, just hold on to it and we'll come back to it during the discussion. So uh, I'm excited to introduce the first speaker, Natalia Guerrero, who will tell us about test objects of interest. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you so much for um, inviting me to uh, speak here. It's really, I'm really honored and excited. Um, listening in on the talks yesterday, it seemed like there's there's a lot of cool stuff going on, and I'd like to talk about how the the test catalog can help with with further investigating the relationship between stars and planets. Um, so I work at MIT as the manager of the test objects of interest catalog for the test science office. Um, I'm part of a huge team of people that contribute to this catalog. Um, we have a steering committee that overlaps with other parts of the test science office, including follow-up and the TIC catalog. And the catalog would not have been possible without our huge team of dedicated vetters. Over the course of the two-year prime mission, this team has vetted over 30,000 different um, threshold crossing events or things that eventually became planet candidates. Um, we're always looking for new vetters, so if that's something that you or students or people you know would be interested in, please let me know. Uh, so the test prime minute mission uh, finished at the beginning of July, and we are now starting our third sector of um, the extended mission today. And so we observed 70% of the night sky, and in that time we have found um, a catalog of over 2,000 um, test objects of interest. So how do we go from those to, from millions of stars in those fields to the test objects of interest catalog? Um, so the catalog is uh, pulls from both the two-minute Spock chart, the two-minute cadence targets that are the postage stamps and the full frame images, which were 30 minutes in the prime mission, but are going to be 10-minute cadence in the extended mission. Um, from those, we identify the both of, there are two pipelines, the pipeline of record for the uh, two minute targets, which is at the NASA Ames Science Processing Operations Center. Um, and we have an internal pipeline, the quick look pipeline for extracting light curves um, and doing planet search from the full frame images. So um, the output of the transit search for both these pipelines are the threshold crossing events. And there are still thousands of these events, too many for our team of vetters to go through on a sector by sector basis. So we do some initial processing to distinguish transiting from non-transiting events um, in automated triage. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and then we go to a vetting process, which is where individual vetters look and inspect light curves. Um, so, we have both an individual vetting session and then group vetting sessions, which meet about twice a week. And um, the targets that they elevate to the level of planet candidate that are um, that would benefit from additional follow up make it into the TOI catalog. Overall, from the end of a four week sector, this takes about five weeks, depending on um, the analysis from all of the pipelines for a typical sector. Um, so we're we use, a question we get a lot is um, machine learning for light cover identification. And yes, we definitely use that for the FFI triage tool. Um, so the quick look pipeline relies on a tool called astronet triage, um, which distinguishes light curves that are transiting from non-transiting. Um, we use a second pipeline, the test exoclass tool, which is based on um, the Kepler robovetter. 
to triage um, light curves from the two minute data. And both these uh, tools are available publicly with code um, on GitHub. And um, we're always really interested in hearing um, ideas and suggestions from the community on how to make these better. So what does the catalog, what is the catalog comprised of? I want to take a few minutes now and sort of dig into the things that are interesting about um, the planets test has found in its two years of observing and maybe highlight some things that are interested for, interesting for stellar astrophysics as well. So in 26 sectors, we found um, just under 600 candidates smaller than Neptune. And as more and more follow-up gets completed, we will have more published planets. So this is what the TOIs look like in period radius space. Um, in this plot and plots going forward, TOIs are the orange open circles. Uh, confirmed test planets are the solid orange circles, and uh, known planets that were reobserved by tests are the red diamonds. I've also plotted this against the Barclay et al. prediction for what tests would find, and so those are the blue open circles. So we can see that in, um, in this space, TESS is finding planets all over the board um, in each of the sort of radius regimes. Um, and filling in some of the space that um, wasn't quite uh, planned for in the, in the predictions. But this is really exciting, especially these planets that are at short periods and that are small, um, because this is where a lot of the attention in confirming planets has been focused. So what, is, um, what do the planets look like in radius space? So we see that we have a number of, so this histogram shows the TOIs compared to the prediction, and I've also plotted our false positives from follow-up at the bottom. So we see that we have a lot of TOIs that are at um, small radii, smaller than four Neptune, and we also have an abundance of TOIs um, at large radii. This abundance we suspect is likely from uh, false positives, um, but that haven't been followed up yet. Um, but so far to sort of qualitative first order, TESS is um, more or less observing what it was predicted to observe, which was small planets. Um, I've gone ahead and bin these by stellar type. And so vertically, we can see the bins by radius. So for M, K, G, F, and A, um, we have a good number of sub-Neptune planets in each bin. Whoops. Um, but as one might expect, for uh, brighter stars, we do observe a larger fraction of large planets because that is what's easier for us to detect uh, larger planets around larger stars. Uh, doing the same thing for period on our period histogram, we do uh, detect a large number of short period planets. Um, this is echoed by a large number of short period false positives, which we would expect. Um, TESS is sort of either exceeding or matching what the predictions were for planets brighter around stars brighter than T mag 10.5 at short periods. This might still be um, unresolved false positives, this really short period peak. Um, and then doing the same thing, binning um, by stellar type, we can see that short period TOIs um, dominate in each uh, a spectral type. This is probably like none of these data are corrected for actual population um, abundances, but we can see that this is actually likely because um, the average test sector is 27 days and it's really easy to detect um, planets that are half of that period or less um, because they transit multiple times in a given orbit in a given sector. Um, but I, as we um, go back and look at the data again, um, we'll find more long period planets. Um, but this is exciting uh, because for short period planets, um, just looking at uh, the period on the x-axis in this plot um, and then the equilibrium temperature on the y-axis, um, we can see that before tests, uh, we had measured a lot of short period warm planets. Um, these are the test known planets, so planets measured again by tests um, and also confirmed planets from surveys that weren't tests. So plotting the TOIs on top of that, 
we can see that um, the catalog is filling in a lot of the space above and below what we already knew about. And so this is exciting for folks looking to explore um, additional temperature and period regimes. Um, in general, uh, just sort of looking at the um, TOIs against the, the broader stellar population um, on this color and then magnitude plot from the paper. This is made by Chelsea Wong. Um, in green, we see all of the stars that were above 13.5 test magnitude that were um, in the two years of test observation. The pink open circles are the TOIs themselves, and then the orange Xs are uh, false positives. So as we expect, um, a lot of the false positives ended up being um, these really uh, large, hot objects around um, evolved stars. But uh, for the TOIs themselves, they tend to fall on, um, their host stars tend to fall on the main sequence. Um, in the extended mission, we're going to continue doing the same thing, searching for TOIs. And we have some preliminary objects of interest that are brand new, um, about, a hand, about 35 from our full frame image pipeline analysis. And we'll be updating ephemeris for um, over 100 uh, or for 166 um, existing TOIs from the catalog. Um, so this catalog is a living list. It's always growing. Um, Exofop tests hosts it and a lot of other useful planet parameters. So we look forward to providing a large set of planet candidates for informing the kinds of things that are discussed at Exostars. Thanks. Thank you. We have time for a quick question or two, and then we'll have a lot more time for discussion after all three speakers. Um, I have a question, which is, were there any results of the uh, primary mission that changed what targets you looked at in the extended mission? especially in terms of types of stars and things like that? Um, I know that from the extended mission, from the primary to extended mission, we, um, the candidate target list for the two minute data um, was changed from primarily being mission targets um, to primarily being um, guest investigator targets. So I think what the community has found interesting is now the priority. Um, but I know that we also have an expanded number of targets that have 20-second cadence data. So I think that's going to be really interesting for astroseismology. Great. Well, thank you so much, Natalia. We'll have more time for questions for Natalia um, in about a half an hour.